Nathan, who I've known for uh, a very long time now, Sandeep. Uh, I don't know exactly how long, but I know uh, at least two decades, I think. Yeah. And um, I've uh, watched him evolve as a journalist and now as a wonderful storyteller. Uh, when uh, uh, I was with him in India today, uh, a few years ago, um, uh, you know, I could see that he could write on anything, you know, you could, he could write on crime, he could write on uh, Bollywood, he could write on war. But really, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, his evolution as a storyteller has really, uh, I think, reached its pinnacle with uh, Operation X. Uh, Black Tornado was his first book. But I think the way he told the story in Operation X, his new book, uh, is just marvelous. It reads like a thriller. You know how it's going to end, but it reads like a thriller. And each chapter you begin with, uh, you know, sort of uh, your heartbeat racing. And he's managed to tell the socio-political story of India and Pakistan and Bangladesh as well. So quite a remarkable uh, achievement. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, I'm, you know, as you know, I'm not a great war person, but even I found it really compelling. Um, tell me what really inspired you to write Operation X. It's such a fantastic book. Thank you. Thank you, Kaveri. Thanks for having me over on Tiffin Talks. Uh, it's so great to be talking to you. And uh, I'm a big fan of your work <laughs> for two decades now. Mutual. <laughs> So uh, the Operation X is, uh, it's an interesting story. I mean, there's a story behind the story itself. And yes. this, is a, this is something that I had been pursuing uh, for almost a quarter century, this story. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was a mention of this in Vice Admiral Roy's, Mickey Roy's book. And as you know, he's one of the characters in the book. He is the well, director. We know him better as Shonjoy Roy's father. But That's correct, he has yeah. He is quite a remarkable person. But a naval spy master in his own right. right. And right. he mentioned this operation in his book, which he wrote in 95, in the Silver Jubilee of uh, the 1971 war. And that's when it struck me that, my God, this is a very interesting story. But mm -hmm. of course, uh, Admiral Roy had left out the part about uh, the fact that it was the Indian Navy that was actually training and uh, you mm -hmm. know uh, launching them in, for their attacks. And then many years later, I just happened to meet Captain uh, MNR Samant, who used to work with uh, Captain Roy uh, in the 71 war. And he told me this incredible story. And it's we were introduced uh, by a mutual friend. And when we met, uh, I mean, it's like he opened a window into another world. And this was something that, this was a story that's never been told before in the great detail that uh, he put out. Uh, and this was absolutely fascinating. And, you know, he recounted, because he was one of the key people on the ground. Mm. Uh, you had Admiral Roy, then Captain Roy, uh, in Delhi as a director of naval intelligence. And you had uh, Captain Samant, based in Kolkata. He was working uh, with uh, General J uh, JFR Jacob and uh, General Jasjit Arora. And the naval component uh, of the Mukti Bahini uh, guerrilla training was the smallest component, but uh, right. it's one of the most significant uh, operations because, uh, I mean, like you've read in the book, uh, it's possibly the only time in military history that you have such a large number of civilians being mm. trained as uh, marine commandos you know, mm. to launch attacks in East Pakistan. And what they achieved was, I mean, it's fantastic, as in like almost 100,000 tons of shipping uh, mm. that was, uh, you know, the, the ships that were bringing in food and ammunition and uh, soldiers into East Pakistan, they were being targeted by these uh, you know, the uh, free swimmers that were being trained by the Indian Navy. Mm. And uh, between August and uh, December, they had sunk this 100,000 tons. And so this story, when Captain Salmon told me, I mean, it was, I almost thought he was making it all, a lot of this up, but then it was true. I mean, uh, he had his papers, he had his diaries, and, you know, so it, he had recounted this entire story. So it was actually left to me then to kind of give it a form, a structure, and then, you know, put it all there. And the fact that he was there, I mean, it was such a great help to have him there. He was always this, you know, uh, force behind that I could always bring him up any time of the day. And okay. night. he would always, you know, tell me, okay, this is what happened and that kind of okay. uh, thing. So he was a, he was a master storyteller in a sense that I just did the writing. You know, so. Not quite, uh, Sandy, because I know that piecing this puzzle together, uh, because the story goes from India to Pakistan, to Bangladesh, to France, I mean, the story has had to be pieced together really well. So uh, take us through the steps and how long did this whole process take you? 
so Kaveri, I had very little time, and Captain mm-hmm. Samant, as you know, he unfortunately passed away yeah. a few months before the book release. He was and in failing health, was he? When you he was were... he was absolutely fine when we first met. We met in mm-hmm. 2017, mm-hmm. and he was absolutely fit. He was all very uh, you know there. But then, as the, the years passed, I mean, it was it was almost a year and. Uh, research and writing and we had a lot of traveling to do I had to go to uh, several trips to Bengal West Bengal uh, there was one big trip that we did to Bangladesh uh, almost two years back where mm-hmm. uh, we, we I went with Commander Kapil who was another person right. uh, another character in the book quite a character <laughs> yeah. so it's all it's an amazing story of all these diverse characters of very very I mean they're larger than life people you right. meet them in real life like yeah. you have uh, Petty Officer Chiman Singh, who's possibly the first Indian commando to operate behind enemy lines. Mm. And you have uh, Commodore Abdul Wahid Chaudhary from the Bangladesh Navy, who you've met, Kaveri. At the yes, I know. What a fantastic character he was yeah. uh, at, at your launch in uh, Delhi. And yes. uh, I thought he was just going to take over the whole <laughs> <laughs> No, so that's it. I mean, he is a man. I mean, you can imagine at the age of 26, he was almost 26 years old when he inspired this entire crew of a Pakistani submarine yeah. that was to, in France. Yeah, to, to desert. Defect. Yeah, and desert, and you know, yeah. follow him uh, all the way to India. I mean, you can imagine the kind of the the kind of uh, charisma that he had to yeah. convince these, and many of them were like almost <laughs> double his age. They're much older, much senior to him. They were all enlisted men, but uh, 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 Commodore Chaudhary had this gift of the gap. He was an enlisted, uh, you know, uh, man then. He was a mm-hmm. young sailor mm-hmm. on this uh, submarine, but he had this conviction. He had this ability. He believed very, you know, deeply in this. And he led these men with him back to India, and that the, the book, of course, tells the story of their escape, how they're facilitated, how they're uh, facilitated by the Indian embassy in Spain, and they're given, you know, fake papers and all, all of this is true. I mean, it actually happened. And it's just, it reads like but, a like card novel. Thanks. And and uh, so at, uh, when Commodore Chaudhary comes to India, he launches. He's launched on a second mission. Yeah. Which is to take another group of commandos, a very large uh, uh, 50 or 60 commandos, into East Pakistan. And uh, now both of these missions could have resulted in certain death for him. Yeah. Desertion is a crime punishable by death. And uh, to be a subortier, to lead a group of subortiers into your uh, native country, I mean, that's another, uh, uh, you know, a, a crime that could have resulted in his certain death. So here was a man who was, you know, uh, cheating death at every turn and... Yeah. You know, leading his thing, and and he's still the same today. I mean, almost yeah. fifty years later, he's almost unchanged. You know, yeah. by you age or by that, time. Or... Yeah, uh, you can see that enthusiasm. Uh, even Chiman Singh, isn't? Uh, uh, did he not come to your launch as well? Yes, or? yes, yeah. he was. He was there, Kaveri, and he is the only uh, naval sailor to have been decorated with the Mahavir Chakra, which right. is the second highest uh, gallantry award. And he's again a very remarkable uh, person because I mean here was someone a young sailor again he was about 25 26 mm-hmm. during the 1971 war and he identified very deeply with uh, uh, the the Bengali uh, uh, you know subortiers that he was mm-hmm. training mm-hmm. and his instructions were to you know take them up to the border and then launch them into East Pakistan mm-hmm. he was part of the launch team he was a trainer and the launch team mm-hmm. but then something inside him snapped and he decided to join them you know and mm-hmm. he felt very deeply for what they were going through, the kind of genocide that was on in East Pakistan at that time, later to become Bangladesh. And he joined them and he actually is the first naval commando to operate behind enemy lines. Mm. And this was a completely unsanctioned mission because, mm. as you know, the Indian uh, training team were forbidden from crossing the line. Uh, they were not supposed to operate in enemy territory because they were afraid of what would happen if they were captured. and you know, right. stuff. So he operated there and he came back and it so happened that he was captured by our own people because, uh, you know, the Indian army didn't believe his story when he said that, right. look, I'm a naval uh, thing. And so he would be, uh, you know, interrogated. And he's the one who meets uh, uh, Indira Gandhi in uh, hospital. That's right. In, uh, that's that's a lovely, lovely incident. Yeah, uh, just, uh, just narrate it uh, for our uh, viewers because it's a fantastic incident. Yes, and so it's Chiman Singh, is, uh, <laughs> uh, he takes part in this gunboat raid, uh, the Indian naval gunboat, the only Indian naval gunboat raid uh, after the outbreak of the war around the 6th of December. Mm-hmm. And the uh, those gunboats are unfortunately shot up by our own aircraft. <laughs> uh, out of the three gunboats, two are uh, completely destroyed. And Chiman Singh happens to be on one of them. He's taken prisoner by the Pakistanis. He's, of course, he's very badly injured. He's treated for his injuries. 
and then he's brought back uh, to india after the war ends and he's at the ins uh, nhs ashwini in bombay mm. and that's where mrs gandhi comes and uh, you know she meets him and all the other wounded people and so she's very uh, she you know there's a lovely picture of him uh, say you know setting up uh, alert on his bed as the prime minister approaches and so um, and she know. asks him and he talks to her about sikhistan that's and, and interesting that yeah so that that is very interesting uh, and in 71 uh, so chiman singh said that you know yeah. he was mistaken for being sikh because hmm. of his name and the fact that he had a very long beard right. and long hair as well because the training team they were asked to you know not they, they, they didn't have these access to you know <laughs> shaving hot water <laughs> the you know barbers and stuff so they all grew their beards and they look like you know uh, nothing on earth so he was mistaken to be sikh and uh, he actually told me that uh, one of his interrogators the pakistani uh, officers actually said oh you know chiman singh we're doing so much for you and he mentions sikhistan he didn't say khalistan but he right. said sikhistan and there was this deliberate attempt by his captors to kind of uh, you know say that uh, look we're doing this for you so why don't you come over to our side that kind of thing he mentioned this to mrs gandhi at that time and and that that was a very interesting point so he said that well the prime minister was clearly preoccupied and so she just uh, he said look you know this this mentioned this word uh, sikhistan and and, and and as history as we know from history it was just yeah. a decade later yeah. this whole thing you know exploded and uh, that it was it took her life it took her life uh, through and uh, so this But was like the way she says aap aap ab aa gaye hain aage aage ab hum karenge ab hum karenge that's right uh, you know um, apart from uh, these heroes these military heroes you also have these uh, uh, amazing characters you know like yaya khan tikka khan yeah. i mean these were all uh, uh, i mean some vicious and you know also larger than life uh, created havoc in bangladesh talk a bit about both of them yaya khan as well as tikka khan who was known as the butcher of balochistan right that's correct yeah so yaya khan um, is the second military dictator of pakistan yeah. he kind of deposed uh, ayub uh, field marshal mm. ayub mm. and he took over in the late 60s and uh, he had this grand vision of uh, you know the guy who would actually bring democracy and stability to pakistan and he as was you know he in dehradun right uh, sandeep uh, yes Hmm. so all of the uh, early uh, um, uh, pakistani generals and all that because undivided india they yeah. were all trained here yeah. so you have uh, the classic case of uh, in the book itself you have captain saman yeah. and uh, you have his adversary on the opposite side right. who is someone who he shared a room with for 3 or 4 years you Can know you imagine? Same, yeah How so must have been it's it's almost bizarre the way yeah. the kind of thing that you know erstwhile comrades were now on opposite sides yeah. so um uh, Ayub Khan was deposed by Yahya, and then yeah. Yahya took over with this thing. And as you know, Kaveri, all dictators in Pakistan have this uh, God-given mission to set things right, which is why they take over the country, and then yeah. they realize they leave it in a bigger mess than it was when they took over. And uh, Yahya also believes that he has been sent by God to set the country right, and he decides to you know hold elections and uh, you know uh, devolve power to the people and. as you know the elections that are held result in uh, mujibur rahman sweeping right uh, the elections and actually you know making a claim to be the prime minister of pakistan, pakistan. and <laughs> that is when uh, zulfikar ali bhutto says hey we are not going to let that happen <laughs> and that is when the whole trouble starts in mm-hmm. 1970 and they hold the uh, results of the election in abeyance and that is when the uh, east pakistan you know rises up in ferment and all the troubles begin and that's when the military comes down heavily on them and uh, march is when the whole thing begins in march of 1971 uh, where they imprison uh, the sheikh mujib and uh, you know they bring about one of the worst incidents of uh, genocide yes, post the second world war yeah. and it's captured in very graphic detail by this journalist called Anthony Mascarenhas right. possibly one of the bravest journalists in the 20th century a Pakistani journalist who saw this you know unfolding before his eyes and he wrote it in the Sunday Times because he couldn't publish it in Pakistan right so this thing of uh, genocide that he saw it was ex- uh, you know it was it was it had the sanction it had the support it had the connivance of the entire Pakistan military Uh, starting from yaya khan and he had dispatched this guy called tikka khan to uh, supervise this thing and tikka khan was someone who had 
distinguished himself uh, infamously in Balochistan. He's called the butcher of Balochistan, and then he becomes the butcher of uh, Bengal. And he's sent there, and his instructions are to carry out such a reign of terror that the Pakistan army should never have to return again. <laughs> And what you see them doing, and it's recounted by Mascarenhas in that Sunday Times article. It's possibly one of the most influential pieces written in the 20th century. It's, it's just got one headline, just genocide. Genocide. And he describes what they're planning to do, which is completely destroy all opposition within East Pakistan. You know, uh, and they're even talking in terms of re-engineering the population there. They want to bring a breed of new East Pakistanis who will be completely beholden to uh, West Pakistan. There would be no rebellion. They would do away with all the, uh, you know, Awami leaguers and the minorities and all of those things. And th this is the plan that he describes in very great detail. So in a sense, you know, this is, uh, uh, war is never righteous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but when, you, when you're faced with such uh, evil, you know, whether it's in the Second World War, what the Germans were doing to the Jews, uh, mm -hmm. Or what you have here in uh, 1971. This is this was a righteous war, mm -hmm. if you look at it in that sense, mm -hmm. because this is what they were up, uh, what Mrs. Gandhi was up against. She had a major point, and she read that story as well. And she later said she told this. Uh, I think she said this to uh, the editor of the Sunday Times that uh, you know that article was one uh, thing that uh, it turned my mind about what was going on in East Pakistan. I was absolutely convinced after that that this is the right the right uh, thing for me to do that's why journalism still matters yes <laughs> but sandeep what has the reaction been in bangladesh to this book we know that in india uh, people were surprised i think a lot of people didn't know about uh, this incident perhaps people even in the army or and the navy what was the reaction in bangladesh uh, well kavi Overwhelming reaction. A lot of people have absolutely loved the book and all, but you know, it wasn't news to them. Oh. And this is the strange part that uh, yeah. there have been several books on these operations written by Bangladeshi authors, but all in Bengali. Okay. But uh, but it was written from their perspective. Now they never knew, for instance, that there was such a large, well-organized naval Indian Navy machinery working there. They knew a few names of the people and the trainers, mm -hmm. which would indicate that, yes, there was government support, but uh, they didn't know the extent to which it was. And there have been uh, naval commandos. They called naval commandos there, uh, incidentally. It's a, it's a, you know, it's an honorific for them. And uh, one of them called Khalilur Rehman. Unfortunately, I couldn't meet him. Uh, he well, He's actually the chronicler of the naval commando operations. He passed away a few years back. In fact, before I started working mm -hmm. in the book. And he's brought out two or three books on this, uh, which details in, and he's uh, compiled the biographies of all 400 plus naval commandos. Wow. And, you know, very, very big books that uh, he's put in great detail about the operations and all that. So in uh, Bangladesh, it's already well known. The, the heroes they have featured, I mean, uh, Komrod Chaudhary is a national hero decorated uh, with, you know, two gallantry awards, uh, even our... 1971 war heroes looked upon, you know, very, very favorably there. And so they knew about it, but, you know, they kind of welcomed it. So the Indian High Commission in uh, Bangladesh, uh, yeah, they make it a point to gift this book to dignitaries whenever they meet them. That's so, yeah. yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's a kind of uh, thing, you know, it's a reaffirmation of the bonds between the two countries. Because, I mean, Bangladesh was created because of the efforts of India. And, and I'm not at all discounting the fact that it was through the blood and the sacrifices of the Bengali people. I mean, had it not been for their sacrifice, I mean, th that country would never have come into being. Hmm. Now, which is yeah. why Captain Samant insisted that the book should be dedicated to, uh, you know, uh, the Sheikh people of, and the, the people of right. Bangladesh. So, uh, Sandeep, you know, you've been writing on uh, the army and uh, the armed forces for a while. How difficult is it to actually get uh, your hands on documents, on records? What, are, what, is, what is the procedure? We all know even the Henderson report, Henderson Brooks report, for instance, it's been declassified, but yet I believe you cannot really get your hands on it, isn't it? It's, uh, I mean, Kaveri, I always begin with this uh, wonderful story uh, of what, 10, 12 years back when somebody asked the government of India under an RTI, what is the government of India's uh, uh, declassification policy? And that journalist was told that that declassification policy is classified. 
ko. <laughs> that that is that's hilarious. That, that that tells you all about our uh, you know the way we you know preserve history or uh, so we very lousy uh, at uh, you know record keeping uh, or even you know declassifying uh, uh, our uh, military operations. This we've had a very very rich history of military uh, uh, you know wars and conflicts from 47 onwards yeah but we have not had official documentation very sadly i mean uh, very few operations have actually been declassified henderson brooks is one of them that's still you know uh, not been declassified and that's the biggest uh, thing of it's been almost uh, more than 60 years now and the government of the day i mean Subsequent government. Every that's government says that we will declassify. War, right? Yes, it's about yeah. the Indochina war. It yeah. was, it's a very, very, uh, yeah, you know, a, a very detailed description of what exactly went wrong. And uh, the point is that, you know, if you don't study your failures, you will con continue to, continue make, to make them. Yeah. And, and uh, there are other operations, like, for instance, the uh, papers relating to the IPKF operations, for mm. instance, in Sri Lanka. I mean, we don't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. uh, 1971, tragically, the entire, all the archives, all the records that were in the in, in the military headquarters, in the army, for instance, have all been destroyed. Why? Uh, because, uh, I mean, for reasons of secrecy, because they didn't want to, you know, tell the world that they were actually, the Mukti Bhaini was being trained by us. So, uh, you know, things like this, I, I don't think we're very... Tragically. Uh, they, it, yeah, so it's, it's actually a loss. Uh, it, it, these are like momentous... Uh, you know, grievous losses to military history. I mean, I can tell you one small example of this uh, Pakistani submarine mm -hmm. that you know that sank off Vishagapatnam in 71, yeah. the Ghazi. The Ghazi, now, yeah. Uh, so from the Ghazi, when the divers went down on that submarine, they, you know, mm -hmm. unearthed a wealth of records, the, you know, uh, ledgers, maps, charts, diaries, all of that. There were literally thousands of pages of uh, archival material they were all with the naval headquarters, uh, with I think the Eastern Command for several years. Mm. And uh, in the 90s, someone started looking for them. Admiral Hiranandani started looking for it. He was the official historian. Mm. And uh, he was just told that, look, all those papers have been destroyed. Mm. Uh, and there's no, uh, uh, there's no uh, system of actually, you know, classifying these papers, you know, uh, putting them into an archive, studying. It, that process has begun very recently in the last, you know, 15 or 20 years. But prior to that, a whole lot of uh, papers have been, all papers have been lost. They're not being declassified. Nobody wants to, you know, uh, step forward and say, take the risk on their, uh, you know, shoulders to say that, look, I have decided to declassify it. And, uh, you know, so we, uh, as, as uh, military writers, we've been telling the government, whoever we meet, the, uh, that, you know, at least redact portions of those reports, release the ra larger reports. And, portions that you think you redact are, them are, you redact yeah. them you, you blank as it's done as it's does done it. in the west yeah exactly so uh, and you know have a declassification policy look the 71 war is like almost a half and next year is going to be 50 years yeah. since that and we still don't have all those papers a lot of those documents are still locked away uh, but you know here again uh, there are islands of uh, excellence uh, kaveri like you know rn kao ramnath kao Right. A classic case of someone who knew that this was a problem. So he started dictating his own memoirs. Hmm. And he has done a kind of a personal declassification kind of thing that, you know, certain papers would be accessed, say, 30 years after his hmm. time and certain other papers 50 years after his time. So he kind of put in a staggered thing. I think the next batch of uh, his memoirs that come up uh, for declassification, somewhere in 2025 or something, hmm. the 71 war uh, thing. Will which be is, part of that. Yeah, so uh, 71 war and Sikkim would all be part of his... Uh, that will be fascinating. Huh? It, it will be indeed, because he was one of the leading lights behind yeah. this uh, the freedom movement of Bangladesh. That's right. So that, that's the thing, that overall, it's a, it's a tragic story. We rarely get to see records. We rarely get to see reports. Uh, you know, what little reports come out, it, the government puts it out. And we know that they are... Uh, uh, based on official records, because we are told that, look, this so-and-so report that's come out was based on an official declassified kind of thing, which cannot be called declassified, <laughs> but we're putting it out in the public domain. So, mm. but, but so the, the way it's approached also the history, the way the history is written, the official history, it's, it's absolutely boring. There's no life in it. Uh, you know, there's no, there are no characters. Nobody's analyzed. Yeah, I mean, it's if, just, 
if you tell it like this, uh, I mean, every child will uh, read it. I mean, do you remember we all grew up on Commando comics? Yes. Uh, we should have an equivalent in India. We don't. Yeah, it started off late, but uh, just not about very, five or six not years. Not very ago. well done, no? Yeah, it, 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 yeah, not of that quality. And, and plus now it's the entire that entire generation your target audience has moved to the digital media yeah they've They're all into moved to video games video games and netflix and all that so that print thing that should have actually uh, you know uh, you should have caught them like 20 years back they kind of missed the bus on that mm. but uh, let's talk a bit about the return of the war movie uh, you know we all know that you're a movie enthusiast as well so, uh, and, the, and this uh, war TV series, they have become huge. What, uh, what in your, um, uh, how do you explain that fascination for war, uh, you know, as, as a spectacle that people want to see and people want to enjoy uh, the success of Uri, for instance? Yeah. So I, I think what's happening now, Kavi, is that, uh, I mean, you know about this more than anyone else. The fact that the entertainment world has now become flat. Yeah. It's just like, uh, you know, a movie that releases in the West. I mean, I saw Wonder Woman yesterday at the yeah. same time as half the world saw Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Uh, uh, the guys who were there to go it, into a the theater. Oh, uh, it, was, it was fun. You know, it was one of those escapist kind of movies. And for me, the uh, thing is that this is the second big movie that I've seen off late in a near empty theater. I was so Tenet? Four people. Tenet was three of us. Um, <laughs> uh, me, my wife and a friend. So that's, that's three. it. And uh, Wonder Woman was with five people, the three of uh, us and two other people in the hall. So, right. I mean, that actually makes me worry about the future of uh, cinema, yeah, yeah. Uh, but not about entertainment. I think right. entertainment exactly. will always find an outlet yeah. and, and yeah. we've seen it with OTT. Right. So, uh, you know, coming back to your point about the uh, war uh, genre, uh, what's happening, I think, is that because of this flat earth that we're looking at in terms mm -hmm. of uh, content, the, we've, we're seeing a lot of content from overseas. Like, so, you know, people are, uh, the, the younger generation of today, they're asking, like, where are our stories? Where are our war stories? Where are our war heroes? Where are our commandos? So you had the film called Uri just coming in right at the time when that entire OTT thing had begun to pick up in India. And, uh, you know, it's to the credit of Ronnie Screwwala to kind of pick up a movie like that and give it the treatment that it deserved. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, I mean, if you look at the uh, the treatment that it got and the special effects and the acting and all that, it's, it's almost on par with the Hollywood action film. I agree. Very and slickly made. So very slickly made. So the problem with all our war films is that they got bogged down in a kind of, you know, a, a patriotic kind of thing. Yeah, or, the you border, know, the border, songs right. and the songs, melodrama. Yeah. Uh, so one of the uh, war film stories that I'd written for you many years back in India today was uh, I, I remember talking to Amir Raza Hussain, who was right. doing, uh, uh, the thing on Kargil, the movie, and he said, "We don't make war films. We just make song and dance films with some war." <laughs> <theme."> <laughs> right. So it's you know that the fact that we are we always fight shy of making uh, in your face war movie yeah. like uh, say Hakikat. Hakikat right. was a one off. Yeah. Uh, the, the whole horror of war, you know, what a defeat is all about. I mean, we've never touched that subject. For instance. Yeah. We will never make a movie on Sri Lanka. I mean, I would really be curious to yeah. see a movie on the IPKF experience. Exactly. For uh, you know, that never gets made. A 62 war would never get made. Yeah. Because these are, I mean, this is all about soul searching and you know, looking right. inward. And what did we do? Why did we go there? Why did we do what we did? Did we make enemies of people there? You know, like it was our little Vietnam. That kind of yeah. thing we never see. We only want to see victories. And in the sense, so, I mean, Uri was one film that actually gave you that on a very large scale. It was very successful. And that led to a whole lot of other uh, OTT. Uh, yeah, there's Avrod and there's a whole lot of yes. uh, the so, heroes of Car uh, Cargill and the heroes yeah. of... Uh, so there's a whole lot of uh, movies now being made on that uh, thing. But uh, And now with OTT picking up, you have, uh, you know, there's this huge, uh, you know, demand for content and they want, uh, you know, uh, books, they want original material. So that's how uh, my first book, Black Tornado, got picked up and made into an OTT. And, right. and it came out at the time, you know, just when the lockdown was about to begin. 
yeah. the twentieth of March, just a few it, days before that. I think it's done quite well, hasn't and it? It's yeah, it's done uh, quite well, and I think they're very. The makers are very happy. Uh, Vimal Yu Singh certainly very happy because he seems to be making many more uh, <laughs> after this. Uh, so uh, it's it's really caught on because I think it was the first um, uh, OTT that spoke about an event that's still very fresh in our minds. Right. Uh, not so long ago, and uh, you know, everyone identified with 2611, and uh, so he did a good job. He got an international cast, uh, international production, uh, you know, uh, crew like the uh, DOP and the director and the script writers, and so they did a great job. I think. How how difficult was it to write uh, Black Tornado in comparison with Operation X? So, uh, Kaviri, again, uh, Black Tornado was something that. Uh, you know, after that initial uh, phase of the first wave of reportage that was done on 2611, um, I came in, you know, as usual, a few months later after the, the, being the magazine guy. Yeah. <laughs> and I started looking at a story that uh, we could tell about this. I was actually looking at it for, the, for India Today magazine. And indeed, a lot of it did come in. The coverage came in into the magazine. But then I looked at the larger story. And I said this whole thing of, planning the operation and all the characters and all this is this deserves a book you mm. know it can't be told in this and and just like i had uh, uh, captain samant in uh, operation x i had this friend of mine who was in uniform at that time he was my supporter and my guide so he kind of he was uh, in he was, nsg uh, yeah he was in the nsg i can name him now because he is no longer with the nsg right. he's colonel sandeep sen Right. Uh, he was the namesake. number two. There were so many of your namesakes there. Uh, there were three namesakes in, in the book yeah. uh, with the same uh, first name. And myself and Kuku would be like four, four of us yeah. with the same first name. So yeah. uh, we used to joke about having a party of all of our uh, you know, <laughs> names. And, but uh, so he kind of, uh, you know, led me through this whole thing. And uh, it's, it was thanks to him that I got access to that report. I could see the report and, you know, base my book on that. The whole narrative of exactly what went wrong and uh, you know the whole planning because this kind of an operation uh, Kaveri I mean we might criticize it it took so long and you know this that it was very ponderous and all of that but this kind of an attack had never been carried out in anywhere in the world at right. that time so it was like a complete a black zone multiple event. locations multiple right? locations at the same That's time the so same it was like uh, it was like 9-11 the only difference is that you had uh, you know these terrorists on the, on the on the ground running around at different places and the original plan, actually, were, which is what uh, the NSG believes, is that it was for to have five parallel sieges. Oh. That you would have two in the Taj, which is why you had four terrorists there. You would have one in the Kabard house. You'd have one in Bombay VT station, the, the Chakrapati Shivaji uh, right. sta uh, station. And, of course, the Obroy Hotel. Really, so yeah. It so happened, uh, I mean, this is so fortunate for them, is that the terrorists lost their way, uh, mm -hmm. Kasab and Ismail Khan at the uh, uh, CST station. Right. They lost their way. They were actually supposed to take hostages and go up into the old uh, building right. and then hold out over there because they were looking at iconic landmarks. You know, Landmark. They wanted to capture yeah. landmarks yeah. and say that, look, the city is now under our... Uh, thing. And, In a way, it was uh, a little uh, like the blast of 92, 93, yes. because they also targeted iconic structures, but not, uh, not these uh, hotels. I think that was what was so frightening and new. Right. Yeah, so that uh, uh, so this is my uh, uh, my little thesis is that the attacks from '93. If you see, there have been three sensational attacks on Mumbai from '93 yeah. to uh, 2008 over 15 there, years. There's '93. '93. There's 2006. The train bomb. Yeah. And then you have 2611. Now yeah. all of these attacks have one thing in common that they're all multiple uh, attacks at the same time, more or less the same time, right. multiple location. And that tells you one thing that these are all planned by the military hmm. because these can't be uh, you know planned by the civilians in the sense that the the terrorists or the gangsters that we thought were behind them or the indian mujahideen or whoever they are uh, these are all planned by military minds because these are all special forces operations hmm. and this actually wisdom came to me from one of the marine commandos who was interviewing for the book Hmm. And he said, uh, Are bhai, you know, this uh, 2611 attack is something that we rehearse for hmm. as Marine commandos. I mean, right. obviously not to hit hotels, but he says that, you know, the entire, all the elements of this have a, a classic seaborne raid, right. of, a, a naval special forces raid, yeah. which is they hit the beach 
uh, they split up into buddy pairs. Right. Like you know, two people would go for a, a, a airport right. tower, two would go for parked aircraft. Uh, two would go for the barracks, you know, those kind of things. And then they would attack and then simultaneously disengage and come back. The only thing that they didn't do was that retreat phase. They were all supposed to, you know, fight and die over there and that kind of thing. So these are all planned by the military man. And there's no prizes for guessing who, yeah. which is the military across the border that sits and plans, you know, yeah. nonstop. So that, that's essentially what they had in common. And that, unfortunately, is what happened in Mumbai over 15 years. Right. So, uh, in fact, I think Black Friday is perhaps one of the finest, uh, 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 you know, uh, chronicle, uh, chronicles of this. Would you agree with that? The, 90, the 92, 93 blast? Absolutely. And I, I think it was the first uh, one of its kind. And, uh, you know, this was a movie that uh, and probably only Anurag Kashyap could have made. Yeah, and the book and, on which, of course, it was based. Yes, by, and, uh, and, Hussain, and again, uh, so, uh, <laughs> so and I worked on that uh, book, incidentally. That was my oh, first exposure. Yes, that that one chapter of the interviews uh, of with the with the uh, bomb blast survivors. That oh, was uh, okay. uh, that was my work, and uh, you know, Hussein actually, we used to have the, these sparring matches in uh, in office at the Indian Express. Yeah, and uh, so Hussein said, "Look, you know, this is your payback." <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so you have to so I, I took some time off from work I was in the Indian Express then and I went right. and I kind of, so that was actually my uh, uh, the closest that I came to the I mean I have seen those blasts in 93 mm -hmm. I was in Mumbai at that time but then to meet with all the survivors uh, that's when the whole uh, you know the, the horror of the attacks actually unfolded the mm -hmm. fact that you know so many hundreds of people uh, had, had been killed over 250 people had died and more, I believe, yeah. more than a thousand had been injured very right. and it's like you know the kind of uh, it's again military because you had military grade explosives being uh, smuggled in from the sea uh, you had AK-47 type 56 rifles very famous now yeah. uh, thanks to a movie star and <laughs> all of that were brought in and, and incidentally Kaveri this this had a second uh, phase two as well uh, yeah. and that is what they actually carried out in 2611 Right. which was to get these trained underworld operatives to go and attack all these, uh, uh, you know, various landmarks. They were right. planning to, uh, you know, send them and attack the BMC headquarters, the Mantrale and all those places. And, you know, literally gun down government officials and all that. So it was a very elaborate uh, yeah. terrorist attack. And fortunately, those underworld operatives, they panicked, they, you know, dropped their weapons. And mm -hmm. uh, Anurag brings it out in Black Friday very graphically. Right. Yeah. How they run across yeah, the country. Yeah, it's quite fascinating when you see that. So, um, but Sandeep, you've also been successful in uh, accessing some uh, 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 sort of classified material for all the work you've done on Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. Talk a little about that as well. That's been more journalistic, but you've done a lot of work in that area as well. Yeah. So that uh, that covery, I mean, you were the editor in India today when that oh, but, happened, and but, was, uh, yeah, but it, we, it, it, it was, was it was yeah, it, it that is again something that happened by uh, by chance because yeah. uh, uh, it was this very very passionate uh, researcher that I would met, uh, you know, who had been following this Netaji story for far longer than anyone else, you know, and almost uh, Anuj Dhar, right? Anuj Dhar, and yeah. he is the man who came to me with a whole set of documents, yeah. and when he uh, you know, I thought this was just another, you know, okay, <laughs> another, you know. So when I actually sat down and I read those documents, I was looking at the names of the people who were uh, there in those declassified papers. And these were all intelligence bureau uh, papers. Right. And what struck me was the fact that IB documents are normally never declassified. Mm -hmm. So what had happened is that someone in Kolkata had declassified the state intelligence bureau uh, okay. correspondence. Uh, now, the SIB, you have an IB here mm. uh, in, in Delhi and you have an SIB in uh, Kolkata. So it's almost like mirror images of okay. each other. So you had a lot of the correspondence from there with the names of all the senior people who were being reported to that. These, uh, you know, uh, the, the story, of course, is the fact that uh, Netaji's family was under surveillance for decades yeah. after independence. After, yeah. Uh, you know, until the late 60s and possibly even into the 70s because they were seen as, you know, potential political force. And hmm. this work was done by the uh, branch of the IB that looks into, uh, you know, uh, the political side of things, which is not very well known. 
but this has existed since uh, the time of the british who just look at the you know mobilization political mobilization indian political workers this is the machinery that had been set into motion by the british and remarkably continue to work even after independence right in exactly the same way so you know when we say all our colonial institutions our colonial buildings some of them are still continuing <laughs> right. in the same fashion yeah and 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 this is exactly the reason why i say that you know we must have police reforms we must yeah. reform the police the judiciary and all we cannot have institutions continuing this just because they continue to operate doesn't right. mean they are the best you yeah. know fit for purpose right. in our present times right so um uh, sandeep now when you uh, look back at operation x um, you know uh, what is the kind of feedback that you're getting from our uh, film uh, friends in the film world are they interested in uh, uh, adapting it w- what do you hear uh, so well kavri a lot of people have approached uh, us uh, me and captain saman's family but, but you know somehow i don't find um, them to be the kind of filmmakers who could do justice to this yeah uh, now captain saman's family is deeply passionate they're very passionate about this uh, book because it's captain saman's life's work okay. and they're very very uh, you know emotional about this uh, sub and the book and you know uh, so both of us when whenever we kind of look through these offers we find that they're not being uh, filmmakers who could do justice to this mm-hmm. thing because it will also be it's it's across the world no it will have to go to uh, to to europe it will have to yes. go to well bangladesh it will have to be uh, partly in india everywhere right and it it can't be approached the way a normal war film is yeah. done because this is so much more like you mentioned and the, not only the fact that it's not only a military operation but it's also the whole a uh, geopolitics of it there is uh, there's the, all these personalities there's mrs gandhi there's sheikh mujib and yeah, yaya khan you have to make an appearance and yes at at some point and uh, and also it's uh, it is it, it's a kind of a uh, genre that uh, it's it's almost defies description in the indian context hmm. i mean it's a bit of the spy it's a bit of uh, the wild geese or it's a bit of uh, you know the Politics. sea wolves yeah. and it's a whole lot of things because there's military operations there's training there's guerrilla operations and uh, of course then there are the bad guys as well so in a, in a sense it 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 would it couldn't be made as a uh, a feature film like a, a normal 2 hour 3 hour film but i i would imagine a ott would be something that we would be looking at yeah and each episode will have its own hero Yeah. and and general uh, sorry um, uh, uh, our friend uh, choudhry will play himself <laughs> <laughs> yeah komro so, choudhry is in fact we joke uh, you know about him i mean this is he's a fantastic guy he's a great sport so we always yeah. tell him you know uh, choudhry sir you are an action hero you're acting in your <laughs> own movie 24/7 you know it's just like <laughs> but uh, but there are all these uh, and there's another very interesting character again uh, kavri he was there for the book launch this uh-huh. brigadier ponwar basant okay. ponwar who runs this uh, uh, training school uh, with that trains policemen to become guerrillas jungle warriors in chatisgarh wow and he's found himself into arundhati roy's writings arundhati roy calls him the rumpled stilt skin of the war against the maoists <laughs> Really? And and he he began his uh, thing in 1971. So he's there in the book as well. So oh. he's another fascinating guy. He's another wow. action hero. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, there's so much waiting for you, Sandeep. So is it a problem of plenty? What do you do next? Where do you uh, where do you go next as a storyteller? That so that that's always a challenge. One second, uh, uh, one second, Sandeep. There's a question. <laughs> so sweet from Neelam Matthews. Sandeep, would you look at acting at some point? <laughs> <laughs> And acting is what? Uh, yeah. Well, pro- probably playing myself, you know, <laughs> in one of these little things. One of these uh, series where you're the intrepid journalist who's right, putting yeah. the story together. Oh. So oh, as Manu Joseph as we talk Manu Joseph <laughs> oh, yes. his own yes, movie <laughs> yeah as a, asking, as a as a journalist <laughs> asking a question which asking nobody question. could understand not even <laughs> the poor scientist who uh, you know is talking about life extraterrestrial life even he can't understand manu's right. question <laughs> so that's manu i mean this great guy <laughs> that's typical but what a film again i thought what it was a fantastic film. adaptation you know 
it's it's manu joseph meets nawazuddin siddiqui yes I mean, amazing it's as great as that it's and yet so contemporary yeah. i mean it, it it may as well have been written and filmed now as we speak yeah. you know sorry so we were talking about what next for you so uh, well uh, you know these are two uh, military operation themed books that happened to me almost by accident it's not like i went around looking for it it just so happened i was there the right man in the right uh, place at the right time right. i guess so uh, the next one i I've, i've really not started working on it i've been looking at various uh, you know themes and subjects and all that but something one of the also, things that one of the things that excite you sikkim for instance i think the operation uh, in sikkim was interesting uh, tibet what are right. some of these uh, things that you think people should be looking at more closely military non fiction would be one for sure yeah. uh, uh, you know I, i think hundreds of journalists could be writing books on all of these uh, things it, it's in fact there's a black hole from the time of uh, 47 to till about the 80s or 90s or so right. that there was absolutely no military non fiction being written you just had these very rare official accounts of military operations or you had these hagiographies of people saying oh i was there and i did such a wonderful right. job and you know <laughs> that kind of thing or you had the very rare book like uh, say himalayan blunder by uh, uh, you know brigadier dalvi and right. a few books like that but overall i think the the whole the the way we approach uh, you know uh, military non fiction it's been a big disappointment i mean i, I it's think the way we approach history you know it is the way we approach history yeah. exactly so we've not done uh, you know justice to a lot of this thing i mean there's not been very great books written on the 47 48 operations in jammu and kashmir exactly i was that, about to say for yeah. instance you know when the raiders came to yes. uh, baramulla wouldn't came. that be a fascinating book to write or uh, you know or william dalrymple has been doing some great work i mean the anarchy i just finished uh, reading it yeah. yesterday and yeah. uh, it's almost unput down but what an account of almost 100 years of indian history you know compressed into that one book yeah. and you know the way he's written it the descriptions and all that i mean this is the way we should have been approaching our history you know you know in a very you know contemporary fashion way, you know making it accessible to a lot of readers like you know another example kaveri is like if all of us know about uh, general manik shah for instance hmm. but no one knows about general sagat singh uh, i mean sorry even i don't uh, oh, okay well so general sagat singh is the person who uh, was one of the army commanders who uh, basically moved into east pakistan mm-hmm. in 1971 and he's possibly the only person who's defeated the portuguese the chinese and the pakistanis wow and we we know so little about him he mm-hmm. retired as a lieutenant general so he was uh, operation uh, to liberate goa op, op vijay he was part of operation vijay 1967 uh, nathula incident the nathula and chola incidents if you remember that uh, uh, he's been played by jackie shroff in a very small role <laughs> in uh, jp datta's film okay uh, but he's again a, a fantastic military commander who literally thought out of the box self trained right. he's right. a man who kind of rose you know uh, he, he rose from the ranks he was a soldier he's a humble sipahi and then he rose up to become a general and a fascinating military mind you know self taught self trained and bold yeah. thing so we know very little about yeah. uh, the general sagat singh Ma- field marshal manik shah is there because he is so larger than life you cannot but not uh, get vicky koshal to play him in a movie yeah <laughs> but you know general sagat is someone who that uh, you know un uh, uh, unheard uh, unwritten about what about kind. the general who joined bindra wale i mean isn't he a fantastic story as well so, General Shabeg is one yeah. of the characters in Operation X as well yeah. because yeah. he is one of the Mukti Bahini guerrilla commanders. But, But yeah, again another fantastic, uh, you know, hero turned. Uh, oh, absolutely, a yeah. hero turned uh, villain. I mean, villain. A, a fallen angel. I mean, here here was someone who who trained the Mukti Bahini was part of uh, one of the greatest uh, political movements of the uh, 20th century, the creation of Bangladesh, and. a decade later he suddenly you know in the golden temple leading the you know constructing yeah. defenses and killing his own uh, you know uh, comrades and yeah. that that is another uh, you know a tragic figure but i mean something that could be written about but you know like i said these are stories that we don't want to go down yeah. those paths that there are paths like sri lanka yeah. and uh, uncomfortable truths uncomfortable truth blue star and you know that uh, we have a question from indra indrashil rao 
Uh, can you compare what happened between Operation X and what happened in Sri Lanka? Very interesting. Indrashil is right here. Well, uh, hi, hi Indrashil. Yeah, very interesting question now. Um, what happened in Sri Lanka was, it, it was a sequel to what happened in, uh, you know, Bangladesh. And I'm sure you know a lot more about this. The fact that the LTT was one of the groups that was trained by uh, India and by RNEW. Yeah. And uh, this is one of the operations that kind of, uh, that classic thing of a military blowback is what exactly happened here. That you went in, you know, underestimating the people that you had trained. You thought, oh, they're just boys that we train. Mm -hmm. And later, only to, you know, discover to your horror, I mean, how deeply motivated they were and the fact that, you know, you actually got into a little Vietnam of your own there in, uh, in Sri Lanka. There's a terrible thing to happen there. And if you go there, you see those, the, the list of martyrs, the Indian soldiers that have yeah. died over there, the thousands of, uh, over a thousand Indian you know, officers and soldiers died. I and mean, that, that was terrible. That was a operation that we, you know, kind of, we didn't have an end state. We didn't know what we were doing there. Uh, there are people who say that, in fact, this whole uh, IPKF intervention was something to distract people from Bofors because mm -hmm. you had the Bofors scandal going on at that time. So Operation X, everything, you know, it's all glory and uh, ends so beautifully. You have the creation of, a, you, you have the Mukti Bahini being trained and you have the creation of Bangladesh at the end of it. Uh, I um, think the, we didn't have Admiral M.K. Roy and uh, <laughs> Commander Samad there. Yeah. Yeah, well, yes, uh, we didn't have uh, someone who, uh, well, you did have uh, Admiral uh, Roy. He was in the Eastern Command uh, at that time. Uh, around uh, it, it was, I think it, the main activity was after he left, actually. Yeah. Uh, main so, activity in 1985. Yes. Admiral Roy retired in 31st March, 1984. <laughs> well, there you go. So uh, he uh, uh, now... Uh, Sri Lanka, IPKF, not a very happy story. I mean, you think was, it was uh, very badly planned? What, I, what do you think? Yeah, it was, it, we didn't know why we were going in there to uh, uh, Sri Lanka in the first place. A lot of people went in there uh, not unprepared. They didn't have maps. They didn't know what they were doing there. They thought it was a peacekeeping mission. But within a few months, uh, you know, it had turned into a complete uh, war that you were fighting the, the very people that you had uh, trained. Right. And then you had an even bigger blowback when the same people that you trained came and assassinated your former prime minister yeah. in 91. Yes. Because Actually, I mean, one you of the... can see the difference between uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi and uh, Rajiv Gandhi right. in, the, in the vision. Yeah. Yes, yes, true. And the, clarity, and the clarity. But what could have been done with the IPKF? What, what do you think could have been done? I think, uh, you know, there's lots of things that could have... Uh, it would have been to get the Tamils to get a kind of a, uh, this was the one of the uh, part part of the Indo-Sri Lanka peace accord. This is to get them autonomous, uh, a limited autonomy within the larger framework of the country. That, How could it I, I have been achieved? It could have been done. It would have very easily been in done. In a covert way like Operation in, X, you think? No, not, not in a covert way because that would mean you would actually, you'd be more working against the government of Sri Lanka. So the, the end state for this would have been to give Tamils some kind of autonomy within right. Sri Lanka, but not necessarily a breakaway state as the LTT envisaged it to be. That's what the problem, I think, uh, Kaveri in the LTT case was that we all misread Prabhakaran. Everyone in the, including Rajiv Gandhi, including RNAW, they all fatally miscalculated. They all thought that, you know, Prabhakaran, uh, they underestimated him. Hmm. They didn't realize how deeply committed he was to an independent Tamil homeland. Like they underestimated Bindrawali. And exactly. So Bindrawali was a creature of the uh, creature establishment. Of, yeah. And he was created to drive a wedge in Punjab politics. And here again, you had Prabhakaran who you used over there. And then he kind of, you know, turned back on you. And then he went on to do what he did. Uh, but there was... Uh, because the fact is that the Tamils in Sri Lanka did have a grievance, just the way the Bengalis did yeah. in uh, East Pakistan. These are not manufactured yeah. by us or something. The fact is there was a pogrom in the early 80s. You had anti-Tamil riots over there. The, the Sinhala majority did turn against the Tamils, and which is why the government of India intervened at that point and they decided to uh, uh, you know, train them and send them back and all that. But the end state was certainly not for a breakup. But, of yes, I think Prabhakaran was also ruthless. I believe he murdered his own brother. Yeah. Uh, 
I'm not sure about that, but the, if you ask the Sri Lankans, they will tell you that the, uh, the, the LTT has possibly killed um, as many, if not more, Tamilians than they did. And they've, the way he went about ruthlessly eliminating all opposition, whether you know, all the other groups were kind of decimated. Yeah, he was not a statesman in that way. Uh, uh, he was a he was a, a, a you know a warrior who whose entire thing was war and you know he never had that peace thing see every conflict has to have an end state kind of you know you have to come to the political table you have to have you have to have a sheikh mujib yeah you have to have a yes. uh, you have to have a colonel mag osmani who's your military commander but you need to have a sheikh mujib and that is the larger than life figure unfortunately in the case of the tamils you had this prabhakaran who just consumed everything else and there was just him. He was this military warlord, and he didn't believe in any political settlement. For him, it was all eternal conflict and all that. And in fact, that's another fascinating story that there have been journalists who've written about this. But uh, this is again the thing about how the conspiracy that he hatched to kill Rajiv Gandhi. For yeah. him. This is something that I've written out in, in you, India. You've written it, uh, quite a bit. Of yes. Yeah. And, the, and the very fact that uh, you know, I spoke with uh, former investigators of the CBI yeah. who said that you know. Uh, the minute Prabhakaran had signed a death warrant for Rajiv Gandhi, there was nothing that could be done to save him mm. because they had prepared, uh, you know, a fallback plan after fallback plan. That yeah. they had a plan A to kill him here, they had a plan, plan B, B to kill him, and the yeah. plan C to kill him in Delhi. That's how you know fiendishly organized this uh, thing was, and so this is how, how the LTT was. It was just a uh, you know, it was like a, 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 a organization that just believed in endless violence. Is it, but it's now uh, it's now uh, uh, you know more or less defunct, isn't it? Yeah, it, it was. I mean, it, the the the, uh, the way it was done. I mean, eleven years back. I mean, that calls to question the methods that they use, the Sri Lankan military. But they finished them. But they literally, yeah, they uh, you know decimated the LTT, yeah. physically uh, defeated them, and killed all the leaders. Uh, and you know and. Uh, while there is a lot of grievance in uh, Tamil, uh, in among the Tamil people, if you, uh, I've been to Sri Lanka. You and, went there. Uh, you did a story. I yes, guess. and and you know the fact is that Tamils are very upset with the kind of monuments, for instance, that have been erected in Sri Lanka and northern Sri Lanka in parts that were held by uh, the, the uh, Tamil majority areas that the Sri Lankan military has constructed. It's left a very very bitter uh, taste in their mouths. As they see these monuments as, you know, monuments to their defeat. I mean, this is something that countries which are fighting civil wars like us, we've been fighting civil wars endlessly from 70 years, but never have I seen a monument anywhere commemorating a victory against your own people. Right. So that is the difference. I think the way India approaches uh, an insurgency or a, a separatist movement vis-a-vis -vis other countries. And right. I, I think that's one good thing that we do and despite even all this, in Jammu, that's, that's and, very good even in Jammu and Kashmir, I think we even don't in, go even that in far. Jammu and Kashmir, yeah. I have never seen a monument that commemorates the victory of the Indian Army or uh, any particular operation or something. Because at the end, that's of the a day, very state, very statement like statesman like uh, view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. <laughs> but but that's a fact. Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, despite whatever the the criticism of the security forces and all that they, the understanding the larger understanding is that look these are our own people that we are fighting and there is no there is no honor in uh, you know uh, these kind of killings or you know celebrating these uh, murders or deaths or uh, you know encounters and all of that so i think that's a great point that we make. Uh, Sandeep, uh, more or less, I think we've come to the end of the discussion, but I want to ask you, you know, we live in such uh, difficult times where, you know, you have to wear your nationalism on your sleeve and you have to uh, flaunt it. You who've studied war, who've seen war from the front line as well, you know the costs of war. Uh, what do you think about this whole idea of, uh, you know, the, uh, the armed forces being above all questioning? Uh, is it possible in a democracy? No, I, I don't think, Avi. I, I, I don't think the armed forces can be above uh, questioning, not in a democracy. It's not true of any democracy in yeah. the world, yeah. uh, not in the United States, and uh, you know, certainly not in India. And uh, you know, I don't believe that, uh, because then that's, that's not nationalism. Then. Right. then it becomes another ism, it's jingoism. Yeah. So that's something that you know, we really have to avoid. And you know, as, as, a, as journalists, especially when we're covering conflicts, we have to be very mindful about this, you right. know, drawing the line between nationalism and uh, journalism, nationalism and jingoism. So yeah. all these isms, it's, it's like a minefield there. And, you know, right. we should 
no we should, we should stick to journalism and uh, uh, leave the nationalism to the politicians that's right right thank you so much sandeep anitan uh, i think it was such a marvelous discussion uh, i wait for the movie or the tv series on the on operation x and i look forward to your next work as well uh, pavan over to you thank you very thank much you. sandeep thank you Kavari. thank you so much thank you thank you sandeep thank you kaveri ma'am uh, fantastic discussion you know in fact ruchi and i were discussing that you know why ma'am has chosen such a serious topic uh you know as the last sunday of the year this year in any which way has been a watershed one but i'm relieved and i'm thankful to ma'am to bring this up because you know these some of the pointers some of the uh episodes which you which you discussed about um, about our, about history and you know what what has happened in the last few years is is fantastic i think everybody who's joined us today here on on zoom on facebook and of course we're going to put this live on youtube as well tomorrow morning is going to go there uh is actually going to uh, sit back and 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 take cognizance of the fact what we discussed today and it's fantastic and you see the new year thank you so absolutely. much absolutely thank you so thank much and thank you, thank you, so, thank you so much for supporting tiffin talks guys uh wishing you a very very happy new year now cheers bye thank you thanks for having me bye bye bye, bye. take care